two stocks, each of billion dollar companies. One stock with shares at just $5 each, hungry to devour its industry. Does it have what it takes against the $500 behemoth, a leader in its industry and destroying all competitors? If you see one stock comparison video this summer, make it the blockbuster that will make you a better investor. The David and Goliath grudge match for picking the best stocks to buy today on Let's Talk Money. Hey Bowtie Nation, Joseph Hogue here with the Let's Talk Money channel. And you know, I've first got to send a special shout out to all you out there in the nation. Thank you for spending a part of your day to be here. If you're not part of that community yet, just click that little red subscribe button. It's free and you'll never miss an episode. Nation, one of the most frequent requests I get is for low price stocks. Companies trading at $5 a share or less. And I gotta tell you, I get a little bit crazy every time I hear it. That's because price really means nothing for the value of a stock. For that, you really need to go deeper, comparing stocks on other measures to pick the best stocks to buy. In this video, I'll give you a complete seven point checklist to compare stocks. I'll show you how to get stock ideas and create a list to research. I'll then take you step by step to find the best stocks to buy to make sure that you've always got the best investments. And to help you with that process, I'll be comparing a $5 stock, Gannett Incorporated, ticker GCI, with a $500 stock, shares of Netflix, ticker NFLX. I'll compare our $5 and $500 stocks on every step of the process, showing you the easy seven steps that I use to analyze stocks and which is the better pick. And we're getting to the first step in our stock analysis process, but I wanna get your input on this as well. How do you pick stocks? How, what do you look for to find the best stocks to buy? So scroll down and let me know in the comments below, what should I include in this list? Even before I can compare stocks though, I have to get an idea of what kind of stocks I wanna buy. And this starts by scanning the news sites like Bloomberg or the Wall Street Journal. And what I'm looking for here are those ideas that support the long-term universal themes, those decade-long trends that carry stocks higher. For example, from this article about a recent court ruling against Shell on pollution standards, I might get that idea to look closer into renewable energy stocks, a theme that will continue to play out for years to come. To find the stocks in a theme, you can use any stock screener, and first you're gonna screen for the sector of the economy. So for this renewables theme, I can screen for stocks in the energy sector or the utilities. We'll select utilities here, and it gives us 358 stocks, which is way more than I wanna research. So I'll add some more filters here. Now, if we really wanna focus on a renewable energy, then we'll add the industry screen here as well. We'll scroll down to the renewable energy providers, and that's going to cut our list by more than a third. But then let's also narrow it one more time to only those paying a dividend. So we'll use the drop down and enter a dividend yield of at least 1% or more, and that's going to get us down to a list of just 40 stocks. Now understand, this kind of top down stock analysis isn't where you have to start. I like starting here to get those stock ideas because I can focus on those big long term themes that I know are going to drive all the stocks in that theme. Now that only narrows down the list of stocks that I need to research from the 5,000 stocks in the US markets to less than maybe 100 in a theme. But it also means even if I don't pick the very best stock in a group, so if I don't find the best renewables company out there, at least I still know that my stock is gonna do well because that big theme, that universal force, is gonna be driving profits for all the companies in that list. But if you want though, you can start your process in this next step where you get into that actual stock analysis. And some analysts do just that. Instead of looking for the top down themes to find stocks, they go straight to the stocks themselves and start comparing. So here you're just gonna get ideas on those individual stocks and start your analysis. This is where I'll start comparing our $5 stock versus that $500 stock. Six ways to compare investments so you make sure that you're only investing in the best stocks. This is called fundamental analysis because you're comparing the fundamentals, the financial statement measures of these two companies to find which one is the better investment, which one has the best growth, cash flow, and the best profits. Now, before we get to the first in our stock comparison checklist, I need to make a hugely important point. I'll be comparing our $5 and $500 stocks, but I'm gonna be comparing their metrics against other stocks in their own industries, not against each other. The problem here is that those metrics that make a great stock in the publishing industry like Gannett are gonna be widely different from those in the media content like Netflix. For example, streaming services are booming right now, so you'd expect to see much higher sales growth for Netflix than that traditional publisher. 
Now, just comparing the sales growth against each other, you'd get the impression that Netflix is clearly the better investment. But now, what if sales growth for Netflix was actually lower than those comparable companies like Disney or Comcast? And what if Gannett, even though its revenue growth was lower than Netflix, what if it was much higher than other publishers like the New York Times or Meredith Corporation? In this case, Gannett is much more likely to be the better investment because it's doing so much better than those direct competitors. So in some cases, if you're comparing stocks in different industries like we're going to do here, you might actually find out that both or neither are going to be good investments against similar stocks. But let's get to it. And we're going to start by comparing the sales growth of each company. And now for any of these metrics, you can find them on any stock investing app. I'll use Yahoo Finance here for the examples because it's free, but I'll also leave links to some other free investing apps that I use in the video description below. A revenue or sales growth is one of those core measures to compare stocks because it gives you a sense of how competitive that company is against its peers. All companies compete in a limited market, so it's those with an advantage in their product or how they deliver it that allows them to take more of that market in sales. So not only might higher sales mean higher profits for the company and its investors, but it can also point to some of those harder to measure advantages like great management or a better product. Here we'll click on over to the financials tab for Netflix and we see the income statement, which is where revenue is reported. I like using these full year numbers rather than the TTM, that trailing 12 months. So we'll take this $24,996,000 for 2020 divided by $20,156,000,000 in 2019 sales for sales growth of 24% last year. And we'll do the same for Gannett here. So we take this $3,400,000 in last year's revenue divided by $1.867,000,000 in 2019 revenue for an astounding 82% sales growth. So that alone is really surprising that a traditional publisher was able to post 82% sales growth last year. And I would actually want to look into that to make sure it's not skewed by, by maybe buying another company, which is obviously something that it can't do every year. And what we find out when we do this though, is that Gannett did merge with Gatehouse Media, but even with that, without that, that 82% sales growth is impressive given the fact that the competitors like uh, Meredith and the New York Times reported revenue declines of between 2 to 11% last year. Netflix isn't out of the running though. Its 24% sales growth was still much higher than competitors like Comcast and Viacom CBS, which saw sales fall between 6 to 9%. Next, I also want to look at operating income growth and compare that with sales growth. Operating income is what's left of sales after paying suppliers and then all the core expenses to run a company. And you want to compare this against sales growth because any company can boost sales by spending wildly on marketing or, or other expenses, but it's the best companies that can cut costs as well as boosting their revenue. So we'll go back to the financials for Netflix and here where it says operating income, we'll take that $4.585 billion for last year and divide by the $2.6 billion from the prior year for growth of 76% over the year. And that's actually a great sign that Netflix grew its operating income at a faster rate than the sales growth that we calculated at 24% previously. That means the company is growing sales, but also becoming more efficient, cutting costs to produce even higher income. Now, Gannett, on the other hand, if we take this 116 million divided by the 69.5 million in operating income last year, we see that it only grew by 67%, which is actually less than the sales growth. So what we find is that costs at Gannett increased last year as it merged with this other company. Now, a 67% increase in operating income is still excellent compared to losses at similar companies, but, but the win for this one has got to go to Netflix because it's able to drive that faster income growth versus sales. Now, for our analysis, I'm just comparing one year, but take the time and you might want to compare the three and the five year periods as well, just to give you a better idea of some of these longer term trends in these numbers. Next, we're going to compare growth and operating cash flow. And this is one of my favorite measures for finding management shenanigans in account. You see, management can fudge the numbers when it comes to reporting profits. There are all kinds of tricks they use to make expenses look lower or revenue higher, but it is much harder to fudge actual cash flow coming into the company. So, so as an analyst, you'll learn how to uncover these tricks and find companies making true profits. And one of the best methods is by comparing growth in a company's operating cash flow against growth in net income. You see, operating cash flow is the actual cash the business generates. It's one of the best measures of long-term success. 
Net income, on the other hand, that's just another accounting entry and can include a lot of these shenanigans that management uses to make itself look better. So if a company is reporting huge growth in its income, but much lower growth in cash flow, not collecting that cash, then it's a very good indication that management is playing loose with the accounting. It's not necessarily a sign that anything illegal is going on, but, but definitely low quality earnings that make the stock look better than it actually is. And I promise this is a lot easier to find this than it might seem. First, we go to the cash flow statement in the financials. Here we see Gannett reported $57.7 million in operating cash flow for last year against 25 million in the year before and 109 million in 2018. Now that's 126% growth in cash flow last year, but, and this is why I like to look at that longer term trend, it's still about half the operating cash flow it booked in prior years. And if we get back to the income statement and look for this line in net income common stockholders, we see it reported a loss of $671 million last year, which was way above the $119.8 million loss the year before, and the profit of 18.2 million in 2018. But this is really interesting here. Even though Gannett nearly doubled its sales last year, it ended up still reporting a loss of $671 million. Now the loss might not be quite as bad as it looks because we saw that the actual operating cash flow only fell by about 51 million over the last two years and it was still positive, but definitely is something that's gonna give us pause on these shares. Let's go to the cash flow statement for Netflix though, and we see the company booked 2.4 billion in operating cash flow last year, a change of more than 5.3 billion from the cash loss it had in the year prior. Now looking at the company's net income growth, it booked 2.76 billion last year against 1.86 billion in 2019, and just 1.2 billion in the year before. Now that's strong growth, about 50% a year, but less than the growth in operating cash flow. And that's another great sign for Netflix. The fact that it's able to grow its operating cash flow, the actual cash generating power of the company, grow that faster than the net income it's reporting, that's a sign of quality earnings free from a lot of these management accounting tricks. Just two more measures to compare. And here we're gonna look at the debt to equity ratios of each company. Here we'll compare the total debt owed divided by the total equity or the actual investor ownership of the company. A company can have lots of assets and great income, but if it's weighed down by too much debt, then it's really the bondholders that own all those assets rather than investors. Here we'll start with Netflix and go to the balance sheet within the financials. We see here the company reported total liabilities, that's total debt, of $28.2 billion last year, then divided by 11 billion here in total equity. Now that still left 11 billion dollars in assets owned by investors, but it's a debt to equity ratio of almost 2.6 to one if you divide the numbers. Now again, we wanna compare that to similar companies and we see a debt to equity ratios of two to one and 2.28 to one for Comcast and Viacom CBS. So, so Netflix does use more debt here and would be a little bit more risky compared to its peers. Looking at Gannett though, we see total debt of $2.7 billion against total equity of just 364 million, which is a shockingly high 7.5 times on that debt to equity ratio. Now what this is saying is that creditors, people that have lent money to Gannett, own 88% of the company rather than the investors. But we know that publishers carry a lot of debt and that seven and a half times on that debt to equity ratio actually doesn't look quite as bad when we see competitor Meredith has a 13 to one debt ratio. Looking at the New York Times ratio of just 0.73 times, and that Gannett seems to be somewhere in the middle of the industry on its debt. We've got those fundamentals. Now let's compare the two stocks on valuation with a price to sales ratio. This is gonna be the price of the stock relative to how much in sales the company generates. So how much are investors paying for each dollar of revenue? And you know the price to earnings ratio is way more popular, but I like the price to sales better. The problem is earnings are so manipulated with those management accounting tricks and the leverage that it's really a flawed number. Sales though, that's a better picture of a company's growth, so I like to use that for the valuation. So to do this, we'll find the market cap of the company. Now that's the total value of the shares available, and we see here it's $751 million for Gannett. Then we go back to the income statement in the financials and have a trailing revenue here, so sales over the last 12 months of 3.23 billion. And if we take that $751 million divided by the 3.23 billion, we get a price to sales ratio of 0.23 times. Now that is extremely low. Shares of Gannett cost less than a quarter of the sales it produces, a very low valuation, but it also reflects so much that we've already seen. 
you know, investors just aren't gonna pay that much for a company that is losing money and has so much debt. And when we compare this to its competitors, we see a 0.64 times price to sales ratio on Meredith and a 3.9 times multiple on New York Times. Now, shares of Gannett here are way cheaper than these two peers. So just on this measure, the stock doesn't look quite as bad. And of course, we know that Netflix is much more expensive. We have a market cap of $217.8 billion against sales over the last year of $26.4 billion giving us an 8.25 times on a price to sales ratio. But remember, Netflix is also growing those sales by 24% a year and getting more profitable as it does it. So you'd expect those investors to pay more for that growth. And looking at competitors, Netflix is also way more expensive here than that two and a half times price to sales multiple on shares of Comcast and even more so compared to the 1.0 times price to sales on Viacom CBS. Now it's your job as an investor to take all this together and decide if those other factors that we've seen, sales growth, profitability, everything else, if that justifies that higher price multiple. And what we do see though, and this is why you absolutely have to do this kind of analysis, is that the cheaper stock, those $5 shares of Gannett, are not necessarily the better investment. Even at almost $500 a share, Netflix has higher sales growth and profitability compared to its competitors. It's got some great fundamentals versus that questionable business in our $5 stock, something that you'd only see by comparing the stocks together. Click on the video to the right for a complete resource guide for learning about stocks, everything you need to take your investing to the next level. Don't forget to join the Let's Talk Money community by tapping that subscribe button and clicking the bell notification.